Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Um, what I will say now is intended to serve as an introduction to this trial. Uh, these remarks are not a charge on the law. Uh, I will instruct you on the law in greater detail at the end of the trial before you retire to consider your verdict. But this is an explanation of the procedure that we will follow in this trial so that you may better understand what's happening. The defendant is charged with two counts of murder and two counts of possession of a weapon during the commission of a violent crime, the elements of which will be explained to you later. He has pled not guilty to these charge, charges. He's presumed to be not guilty of these charges. He cannot be found guilty unless the state presents evidence which convinces you, the jury, of his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The charge is simply the documents by which the case comes into court. Your purpose as jurors will be to decide the facts of this case. And out of all the people who were summoned to come here for jury duty, out of all the people who live here in Colleton County, out of all the people who live here in the state of South Carolina or any place else, only the 12 of you who will deliberate can decide the facts of this case. And you will determine the facts of this case from the testimony which will come from this witness stand together with any exhibits which is made a part of the record or any stipulations entered into by counsel. It is especially important that you perform your duty diligently and conscientiously and in conformity with the oath that you took because ordinarily there is no way to correct an erroneous determination of facts by a jury. Now, just as only you can determine the facts of this case, as the presiding judge, I am the judge of the law. You must accept as correct the law as I state it to you, then deliberate and decide. I cannot tell you what the facts are. You cannot disagree with me as to what the law is. And even if you disagree, you must follow the law as I state it to you. You take the facts as you find them to be, the laws I give it to you, you deliberate, and you decide the case. Until I tell you that it's time to do so, you cannot discuss the case with anyone, including your fellow jurors. You cannot discuss the case with family, friends, or, or anyone else. The attorneys, the attorneys in the case, you cannot discuss it with them or any parties or anyone else uh, that might be connected with the case. Should you discover that a fellow juror is violating that oath and that order, you are to bring that to my attention. It's also it's vital that you do not uh, seek information outside of the courtroom during the case. That means that you're not to uh, search internet websites, uh, watch television reports, news reports, any other form of social media accounts of the case because you are sworn to uh, decide this case based on the facts as you determine them to be uh, based on evidence presented in the case as well as the law as I give it to you. Now later in the process uh, I will appoint one of you to serve as the foreperson of the jury. And that person will have the responsibility of serving as the spokesperson for the jury. That person will have the responsibility of presiding over the jury deliberations. And that person will have the responsibility of completing the verdict form representing the unanimous verdict of the jury. In just a moment, the Attorney General will make an opening statement in which he will explain the uh, 
issues as he sees it or as the Attorney General sees it. Uh, following that, the Defense Council will have that same opportunity. Then we'll begin with the presentation of testimony from witnesses. I look forward to working with you on this case and to uh, keep the case moving as, as, as uh, reasonable as we can keep it moving, uh, but we will not um, rush, um, but take the time necessary to have this case fully presented to you. We'll now proceed to opening statements by the state. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. On the evening of June 7th, 2021, at the defendant's property off Moselle Road in Colleton County, his son Paul Murdoch was standing in a small feed room in some kennels they had on the property. About 8.50 p.m., and the defendant over there, Alec Murdoch, took a 12-shade shotgun and shot him in the shoulder in the chest and the shoulder with buckshot. And the evidence is gonna show it was a million to one shot. He could have survived that, but after that, another shot went up under his head and did catastrophic damage to his brain and his head. The evidence is gonna show that Paul collapsed right outside that feed room. And just moments later, just moments later, he picked up a 300 blackout, which is a type of ammunition, but an AR style rifle. And the evidence is gonna show that the family had multiple weapons throughout the property. Picked up that 300 blackout rifle and opened fire on his wife, Maggie, just feet away near some sheds that used to be a hangar. Pow, pow. Two shots, abdomen in the leg and took her down. And after that, there were additional shots including two shots to the head that again did catastrophic damage and killed her instantly. The evidence is gonna show that neither Paul nor Maggie had any defensive wounds. Neither one of them had any defensive wounds as if they didn't see a threat coming from their attacker. And the evidence is also going to show that both Pat, Maggie, and Paul were shot at extremely close range. The evidence is going to show it's called stippling. It's almost like a tattoo that when you get shot very close to a weapon, it leaves marks that the forensic pathologist can see. They were shot at close range and they did not have defensive wounds. And the evidence is going to show that the defendant, Alec Murdoch over there, told anyone who would listen that he was never at those kennels. But the evidence is also gonna show from these things that every one of us, most of us carry around in our pocket, that he was there. And he was there just minutes before, with Maggie and Paul, just minutes before their cell phones go silent forever. Despite what he told people, I was never at those kennels, the cell phones are going to show otherwise. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Creighton Waters. I'm with the Attorney General's Office and I'll be the lead prosecutor. I introduced myself before. With me is David Fernandez, Savannah Gow, John Metters, Don Zelenka, John Conrad, and Johnny James. A lot of lawyers. This is a big case. It's a very complicated case and that's why there's so many people working on it. Sitting in, back in the row, we have David Owen, who's the lead investigator. We have Lieutenant Charles Gent, uh, who's one of the agents. Lieutenant, or excuse me, Special Agent Ryan Kelly, and Special Agent Peter Rodolfsky. Some of the agents that are working on the case, as well as uh, Investigator Isaac Toledo, who's working on the case as well. There's some of the witnesses that you'll hear from as we go through this case. The judge talked to you a little bit about him being the judge of the law. And he gives you the law. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the legal concepts before I turn back to those facts. Just remember, though, he's the judge of the law. So you take what he says 
Uh, but I'm going to explain to you some of the legal issues from my perspective before we talk a little bit more about the evidence in the case. And the first thing is right before you went to lunch, y'all all took an oath. Everybody in this courtroom who's got involvement in this case takes an oath. You know, attorneys take an oath to become an attorney, take another oath to become a prosecutor, judge takes another oath to become a judge, witnesses take oath on the stands, law enforcement take oaths to become law enforcement, but y'all took an oath as well. And the reason why is that y'all have the most important job in this court. Every one of you raised your hand and said that you would well and truly try this case. And it's the most important job here because like the judge said, he's the judge of the law, but y'all are the judge of the facts. Y'all are going to listen to what comes from that witness stand and judge those facts. But you also have to be mindful of that oath. That oath requires you to do that hard job, to make that decision, to call the strike when you see it. It's the same oath. It's just as important as any other oath. This might be the most important in this courtroom. The judge mentioned reasonable doubt, and he's exactly right. It's the state's burden to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. That is a cornerstone of our country. I wouldn't have it any other way. It's a burden we welcome. It's what we want. It's a system that has been well tested and true, and we take that burden to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. And I want to remind everyone that the emphasis is on reasonable. Okay, It's not any doubt. It is reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubt is often defined, and again, listen to the judge how he defines it, but reasonable doubt is a doubt that would cause a reasonable person to hesitate to act. To hesitate to act. And when you hear the evidence coming from this stand about this particular case, I submit to you, you won't hesitate to act. Again, remember the emphasis is on reasonable and reasonable doubt. The judge mentioned the charges. And there are four of them. First indictment accuses Alec Murdoch, to which he's pled not guilty, but it accuses him of murdering Maggie Murdoch. The second indictment accuses him of murdering Paul Murdoch. The third indictment accuses him of possessing a firearm during the commission of a violent crime, that being the murder of Maggie Murdoch. And the last one accuses him of possessing a firearm during the commission of a violent crime, and that being the murder of Paul Murdoch. And what does that mean? What is murder? Well, the judge again is going to instruct you that it is the unlawful killing of another with malice of forethought. And what is malice? Malice is a mental state. That's ultimately going to be for y'all to determine as to what was going through Alec Murdoch's mind when he created and he committed these crimes? What is malice? Malice has often been defined as the intentional doing of a wrongful act without just cause or excuse. It is the intent to inflict an injury under circumstances that the law would presume an evil intent. An evil intent. And when you look at the circumstances of the crime, when you look at what led up to this crime, the evidence is going to show that there was malice a forethought. A forethought, what does that mean? It means it has to exist that the moment you commit that crime. It doesn't have to be planned. It doesn't have to be planned for any long period of time. It just has to exist a split second before the crime is committed. But when you see this crime and you hear all the circumstances, the evidence is going to show that a forethought that existed for a while. It existed for a while in the mind of Alec Murdoch. You're also going to hear about circumstantial evidence. And a lot of times people hear, oh, it's just a circumstantial case. But the law says otherwise. The law says that circumstantial evidence is just as good as direct evidence. And what's the difference between the two? Direct evidence is supposedly about to storm out here, from what I'm told. Direct evidence is if it's sunny outside and a witness goes outside and it's sunny and they come in here and they get on that witness stand and because they saw it raining, they sit on the stand and said, I was just outside and I saw it raining. I saw it raining. That's direct evidence. They actually saw it raining. But to give you an example of what circumstantial evidence is, is if the witness goes into a room, a room where all the curtains are drawn, and when they go into that room, it's sunny outside and everything's dry. And while they're in that room, they see it darkened behind the shades. They hear thunder. They hear the wind blowing. They hear 
the sound of raindrops on the roof and then they open up the door and it's not raining but everything is wet there's puddles in the driveway there's puddles in the street there's puddles in the yard there's limbs down all over the ground and then they come in here and say yeah it was raining didn't actually see it raining but those circumstances are beyond any reasonable doubt that it was actually raining now i guess it's possible that somebody could have been standing outside their window and beating a drum to sound like thunder and blowing a fan to make it seem like it was the wind and somehow got enough water to, to coat the entire neighborhood. But that's not reasonable. Everybody understand that distinction? That's not reasonable. Another thing, and this is crucial, what you're going to do in this particular case is determine credibility or the believability of witnesses. So it be your job to look at the evidence, the exhibits in the case, but also the witnesses and decide if it's truthful, if you believe it, if you can rely on it. And the judge is going to instruct you uh, that you can believe one witness against many or many witnesses against one. You can believe all of the witnesses' testimony or part of the witnesses' testimony. It's up to you, first individually and then as a product of your deliberations. And what you're required to do there is just to rely on that good old-fashioned common sense. <clears throat> Does it all fit together? <clears throat> is it corroborated? Does it fit with what you would expect? Does it fit with what you expect how real people would act? It, does it seem real? <clears throat> does something seem a little off? Does something seem a little off? You're going to see video statements of Alec Murdoch. <clears throat> You're going to see body-worn camera of him at the scene when law enforcement arrives and hear what he says and hear what he says about that night. You're going to hear three recorded statements on video that he gave with law enforcement and you're going to hear how things progress about what he says and what he, what he says he did that night. Watch those closely. Watch his expressions. Listen to what he's saying. Listen to what he's not saying. Use that common sense. Does this seem right? Or does something seem a little off? Something seem a little off about this. I mentioned that Maggie was killed with a 300 blackout rifle, an AR style rifle that chambered in 300 blackout ammunition. And you're gonna hear evidence that back in Christmas of 2016, Alec Murdoch over there bought two 300 blackout AR style rifles. And then not long after that, one of them went missing from Paul's truck. And time went by, and in April of 2018, Alec Murdoch replaced that rifle and bought another one. Three total blackout rifles that they had, one of them went missing years ago, and a replacement was bought. You're going to hear evidence that Paul and his friend were using that replacement gun. They were standing right outside the side door to the gun room of the house, and they were sighting it in, firing down into a field. And the cases were ejecting. The cases are the empty shell from a bullet, and they were ejecting out into the flower bed right there. And then there's a range across the street, and they shot it there, and there's cases ejected there as well. And they were shooting that third replacement gun just weeks prior to the murders, prior to June 7th, 2021, when Maggie and Paul were murdered. And you're going to hear forensic evidence that the cases that were found in that fire bed, flower bed and the cases that were found across the street at that range were ejected out of the same weapon that fired all the cases that were around Maggie's dead body, that killed her. It was a family weapon that killed Maggie Murray. And you're going to hear evidence that of those three blackouts that Alec Murdoch purchased, when law enforcement arrives at the scene on June 7th, 2021, he can only account for one of them. He can only account for one of them. And that replacement gun is nowhere to be found. 
You're also going to hear evidence that the type of ammunition, the exact brand, the exact model of ammunition that was used to kill Maggie, s &B, 300 blackout ammunition and 147 grain bullets, that exact ammunition, boxes, empty boxes of that ammunition is found all over the property. The very same brand and model of ammunition that was used to kill her is found at multiple locations throughout the property. And you're also going to hear evidence, the same thing about the shotgun shells that killed Paul. That federal double all buckshot unfired rounds were found on the property, as well as Winchester number two turkey loads, the two rounds in the shotgun that killed Paul. Family weapon, same ammunition. It's all the property. You're also going to hear evidence that about a week after the murders, Mr. Al Murdoch's father had died, Mr. Randolph, and about a week after the murders, he shows up early in the morning at his parents' home, where his mother still is in late-stage Alzheimer's at, on Alameda in Hampton. It's uncharacteristic for him to show up early, uncharacteristic for him to show up at all like that. And he comes in and he's carrying something in a blue tarp and he takes it upstairs and eventually law enforcement finds out about that. And they go upstairs and they find upstairs, they find a wadded up, very, very large raincoat in a blue color, could look like a tarp. And you're gonna hear evidence that it was coated with gunshot residue on the inside. On the inside. You're going to hear other evidence of gunshot re residue. You're going to hear that there was gunshot residue on Alec at the scene. You're going to hear the evidence that there was gunshot residue on the seatbelt of the car he was driving. You're going to hear evidence that when Law enforcement got to the scene, he had gone and gotten a shotgun, Paul's shotgun, and that Maggie's DNA was on that shotgun. You're going to hear other evidence from DNA, gunshot residue, firearms examiners. There's going to be a lot of forensic evidence in this case, and I'm not going to get into every single bit of it right now, but I will say that a key piece of forensic evidence that you're going to hear in this case is the cell phone evidence. Alex's cell phone. Maggie's cell phone, Paul's cell phone. You know, this is all amazing technology that most of us carry around in our pockets. It really allows us to do a lot of things and to get a lot done. But this cell phone keeps track of who we're talking to, who we're calling, who we're texting, whenever we access apps. And every time you do that, there's a record kept in this phone unless it's deleted somehow. And if you're using certain apps, you can even get GPS information where you were when you did that to the store on these phones. You're going to hear evidence about that. You're going to hear evidence that when you make a call and it pings off the of cell towers, the location information can be gathered from that as well. And so it allows an investigation to take this and piece together what someone was doing on a particular day. And not only what they were doing, but who they were interacting with and how they were interacting with. This is going to be crucial evidence for you to consider. You're going to hear that particularly Alec and Paul, but also Maggie, were prolific cell phone users to the point where Paul's friends even had a nickname for him about his cell phone usage. Before I talk more about that, there's three family properties I need to talk about. Okay, The first one I've mentioned is Moselle. Moselle in Colleton County. It's called Moselle. It's off of Moselle Road, but everybody refers to it as Moselle. And that property is a large, it's a lot of acres. There's a main house on it, and there's a driveway that goes to that main house. But it used to be an airstrip, and there's an airstrip that goes down, and then down the way, just less than a third of a mile away, just a, a three minute walk, four minute walk, 45 second drive, is the kennels and the shed that used to be a hangar where Paul and Maggie were murdered. So the main house is just less than a third of a mile away. You can see the kennels from the main house. You can see the main house from the kennels. The family 
also had a house in Edisto at the beach. And the evidence is going to show that that is where Maggie preferred to stay, particularly in the summer months. She liked the beach. She was not a hunter. She didn't want to be at Moselle. She didn't want to be at the lodge where it was hot and buggy. She liked being in Edisto. And then you're also, I've already mentioned, the house in Almeida, which is where his parents' home. On June 7th, 2021, you're going to hear evidence that his father went into the hospital and the prognosis was not good. And in fact, he died a few days later and his mother is in late stage Alzheimer's and that, that house being cared for by a caretaker, you're gonna hear from that caretaker. Mr. Waters, yes sir. Can we pause for a moment? We'll be at ease for just a moment. Yes sir, Your Honor. You may proceed. Thank you, Rob. All right. We were talking about the three family properties. Moselle, who has the main house, and the kennels slash sheds. The main house has a driveway, but the kennels also have a driveway. And the evidence is going to show that that was actually as commonly used as the main driveway. In fact, the mailbox is by the kennel driveway. Driving right past those kennels were Paul and Maggie. I told you that you're going to hear evidence that Maggie did not like being in Moselle as much as she liked Edison, the beach house. But that, on June 7th, 2021, she came back to Moselle. And the evidence is going to show that she arrived about 8.15. And the evidence is going to show that from the cell phones that Paul was there at the house, at the main house. And Alec Murdoch himself says that they ate dinner and the autopsy is gonna reflect both Paul and Maggie having similar stomach contents indicating that they recently shared a meal together. About 8.30, about 15 minutes after they arrived, Paul's phone starts moving towards the kennels. You're going to hear evidence again that the defendant said he was never at those kennels, that he was napping after they ate, and he was at the main house and never went there. You're also going to hear evidence about how much Alec used his own cell phone, and it would be unusual for him to be anywhere without his cell phone. At 8, 44, and 55 seconds, Paul recorded a video. He was down in the kennels because he had been talking to a friend of his, and you're gonna hear from this friend because his friend's dog was in the kennels and they thought there was something wrong with the tail. And Paul was recording a video of it to send to his friend. 8.44 and 55 seconds. And on that video, and you'll see that video, and you'll hear from witnesses that identify Paul's voice, Maggie's voice, and Alex's voice. Told anyone who would listen he was never there. At 8.44, in 55 seconds, there's a video. The evidence will show that he was there. He was at the murder scene with the two victims. And more than that, just over three minutes later, 8, 49, and one second, Paul's phone locks forever. He never reads another text. He never sends another text. He doesn't answer calls. Three minutes after that video has the defendant at the murder scene with the two victims, Paul's phone goes silent forever. And in fact, another communication comes into the very friend that he was talking to the dog at 8.49 and 35 seconds, just 35 seconds later, and he doesn't answer it. He never answers another thing forever and ever. And on top of that, 
Maggie's phone locks at 8, 49 and 31 seconds, around that same time, and she never answers another text, never sends another text, never makes another phone call, never receives another phone call. Three minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Three minutes after a video shows he's at the scene with the victims and he told everybody he was never there. Never there. Credibility, ladies and gentlemen. Credibility. So what happens after that? Well, you'll hear evidence that Alex's phone was conspic conspicuously he didn't have a lot of activity from about 8.09 p.m. until 9.02 p.m. And if he was at the kennels, which the evidence will show, why is his phone not with him? Why is it not showing activity? But you will hear that at 9.02, all of a sudden his phone does start to pick up activity. At 9.02, he uh, calls uh, he starts moving. At 9 4, 4, he calls Maggie's phone. Doesn't answer, of course. Doesn't answer. He calls his father, Randolph, who's in the hospital. Doesn't appear there's an answer there. He calls Maggie again at 9 6. Remember, he's just a third of a mile away. You can see it. At 9 6, she doesn't answer. At 9 6, he turns on his car, his suburban. And he texts Maggie that he's going, be right back. I'm going to go check on mom. And he doesn't drive down to the kennels, even though that's where the mailbox is. That's a common place to be, even though you can see it. He's called his wife two times and texted her, and she hasn't responded. But he didn't just drive down there and say, hey, I'm heading. You guys want to go? What's up? What's up? Right there. You can see it. He then drives to Alameda, where his mom is suffering from Alzheimer's, and the caretaker is there. And he starts calling people. He's talking to people. <clears throat> It'll be up to you to decide whether or not he's trying to manufacture an alibi. He comes, he gets there to Alameda, You'll hear evidence about whether or not that was usual. You'll hear evidence about how he was acting when he got there. And he's only there for 20 minutes because he's back underway at 944. And he makes more phone calls on the way back. Calling friends, calling people who will answer. It'll be up to you to decide whether he's trying to create an alibi. And he gets back to Moselle at 1001. He calls 911 at 10.06. Listen to that 911 call. Listen to what he says. Listen to what explanations he may offer. You're going to hear that 911 call, but you're also going to see the body worn camera of the officers who arrived at the scene. The video camera they, they wear so that it records what they're doing. And you're going to see what he did to Maggie and Paul. It's going to be gruesome. There's no other way around. It's what he did. You're going to see crime scene photographs. You're going to see the traumatic injuries that were suffered. You're going to hear from a pathologist, a doctor who will examine the injuries. It's going to be gruesome. There's no other way around. On that 911 call and on the body worn cameras, pay attention to what he says. Look at how he's acting. But he says within a few minutes of each one of those, he says, this is about the boat case. This is about the boat case. And you're going to hear 
some of what was going on in Alex Murdoch's life leading up to that day. Stuff that happened that very day, stuff that was leading up, a perfect storm that was gathering, much like the storms that are coming outside today. Listen for that evidence. Listen to that gathering storm that all came to a head on June 7th, 2021, the day the evidence will show he killed Maggie and Paul. This has been a long, exhaustive investigation. And it's going to be a fairly long trial because it's complicated. It's a journey. There's a lot of aspects to this case. There's a lot of factors to this case. But like a lot of things that are complicated, when you start to put them all together, and piece them together like a puzzle, all of a sudden the picture emerges and it's really simple. It's really simple. Once we get to the end of that journey, and you have a chance to deliberate, the evidence is going to be such that you're going to reach the inescapable conclusion that Alec murdered Maggie and Paul, that he was the storm, that the storm was coming for them, and the storm arrived on June 7th, 2021, just like the storms that are heading here right now, that they died as a result, beyond any reasonable doubt. Thank you.